and welcome to the Jolly Heretic. We are, of course, online public house. We meet on Mondays at 7 p.m. UK time, uh, in which we discuss base science and base research, which is increasingly expunged from our woke joke universities. And increasingly, we also uh, d uh, discuss the, the general decline of Britain, uh, which seems to be going on for our very eyes. And uh, cheers, cheers, doubt, cheers, maximum 187. Um, and uh, sorry, runs. That's very clever what you've done there. Yes, cheers, everybody. Um, and so that's what we're going to we're going to talk about. So, uh, Nick, would you mind um, uh, t telling the assembled, um, you know, uh, in, in a blind date way, who you are and where you come from? <laughs> sure. My name's Nick Buckley, as you said. Um, born in Manchester, raised in Manchester. Spent most of my adult life working across Greater Manchester, tackling social issues, tackling gangs, crime, antisocial behaviour, um, homelessness. About 15 years ago, um, I left Manchester Council and set up an award-winning charity to, to stop kids getting involved in crime. And then we set up a project getting people off the streets, into accommodation and into employment. Um, and then I became slightly famous four years ago. I seem to recall you were cancelled, weren't you? But yeah, so four years ago, I criticised Black Lives Matter. Um, well, when I say criticised, I, I looked at their website and wrote a blog about their website. That was enough to make me um, a Nazi, a racist. The board of the charity I founded sacked me via email because this was during COVID. Um, I had to launch a five-week fight back and with the help of the free speech union we made the full board resign in disgrace we really? appointed a new board and they offered me and gave me my job back that is what we need to do society wide chaps get the entire board to design in, resign in disgrace and even design in disgrace um and uh, and 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 simply simply take over that's the problem with us with us conservative type people or or or, or non non leftists is that we just like to grill we we we, we like to grill we're not neurotic enough to to, to 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 move and shake the world in a Promethean way. That's our problem. And and hopefully um, Nick, I'm not saying he's neurotic, but um is going to move and shake the world. So chaps, I mean obviously you're on the ground in Manchester. I'm not. I'm just a person that's been there three times and it was awful on every single occasion. <laughs> I mean I on the on the last occasion I went there I was I was interviewed for a job uh, lecturing theology at Manchester University. And uh, I, I, I must say, I'm quite glad I didn't get it. My wife, who, as you know, is a vicar, actually prayed that I wouldn't get it because she did not want to move to uh, Manchester. So, so I, I mean, I was offered, uh, the, literally the moment I got off the train, someone said, do you want to buy some hashish? Then mm. I went into the McDonald's uh, in Manchester. Do you want to buy some hashish? Um, and it's a, it's a very, you know, and that was this, was, this was like over 10 years. This was like, when? 50, 16 years ago, this was. So it's a, it's, it's, it's a very hashish uh, friendly kind of a way, and I imagine it's got worse. So, um, chaps, what what are your feelings? Are the main uh, the main issues with Manchester, and how are you going to attend? How are you going to make things better? Well, I, I saw a tweet actually. Uh, Nick Buckley did a post on X, known as tw uh, Twitter. Those tents outside the town hall in Manchester, mm -hmm. the homelessness. Like this is where I start to to see how you know when there's like a lot of lefty people wanting to be mad at the establishment. One thing they do often is they organize the homeless to do big protests to say, look, this is how bad it is under right wing government. You know, it's, the, 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 it's not just the homelessness. It's the type of people who are becoming homeless, the people who should be, in my opinion, locked in a mental institution like we used to have in the olden days. The people who can't live a normal life day to day. They're just they, they're just a massive drain on the economy. And also they make it scary. And also imagine you're like a Japanese investor or you're a Chinese investor. I'm going to do some business in Manchester, but then some crackhead vomits on you at the station. You're not going to invest in Manchester. So it is a financial problem. And uh, yeah, I'm glad that you tweeted that, Nick. Over to you. Yeah, I think if we drill down to this problem to the base, it's the fact that nothing works anymore in our country in, and in Greater Manchester. Nothing works. It, it seems as if, and this is true, all we seem to do is employ incompetent people. None of our services work. We waste money. We recruit people because they tick a box, not because they can do the job. And we've been doing this for decades. And we've been getting away with it to such an extent for decades. But we've got to the tipping point now where it seems as if society is crumbling away. So let's talk about those tents outside the town hall. So first of all, in a modern 21st century, extremely rich country like the UK, nobody should be sleeping on the streets. 
I don't care. Even if it's a lifestyle choice, nobody should be sleeping on the streets. Why do we allow it? Well, we allow it because the, the lefties will scream and shout that it's a lifestyle choice. They, they want to live like that. Who are we to tell them they shouldn't die on the streets? And then we have the council who are just purely incompetent for two reasons. A, because the, the senior management team are incompetent, but they're also incompetent because they're political organisations. And you have politicians who don't know what they're doing directing the top of the civil service in Greater Manchester about how you should run your service. And we wonder why nothing works. For homelessness in Greater Manchester, so rough sleeping in Greater Manchester, there should be a bed every night for anybody who's sleeping on the streets. We offer them the accommodation, which is an amazing accommodation. It shouldn't be amazing accommodation. Otherwise, that's a pull factor for pulling poor, more people yeah. into Greater Manchester. But it should be a safe roof over your head that night. What, if, what are they supposed to do if you're pissed or, or you're on drugs? You're a danger mm -hmm. to the other people in the, in, in the hostel. And that's why we need to look at hostels and uh, that accommodation that we can split into zones. So we, we need zones where you are a drug addict and you've got a history of violence. We're not going to put you with everybody else. So we're going to put you in this one room that you can't get out of, basically. We need security at these places. And we probably need police officers at these places. We've also got mobile um, prison cells in the UK and that we take prisoners to to um, court and things like that. We could have one of them parked outside for when someone goes too far and is a danger. I'm sick yeah, of that, excuses. That, that I like that. I like Nick because I was going to say, how are you going to pay for this? But yeah. it seems to me that if we can just stick them in the equivalent of a van, yeah, um, then 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 that's a lot cheaper. That's 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 inexpensive. Just uh, lock them in a van until they till, till they calm down. I don't know if that gets yeah. through, you know, health and safety. Uh, but that but but that seems to be a, a sensible um, option. And can I ask? As a, I mean, I haven't lived in England for 19 years. And so I only get hints of it, and everyone's telling me like hey, it's just so shit now. So um, let's, let's, go, let's get, yeah, go back in time. It's two thousand and five. That's when I left the UK, and I've had no consistent involvement with it since. Mm. Um, so on a day to day level, how has things got worse? I would say, Ed, like we've lost the cities in Great Britain. Like at the moment, they are under occupation, not just by aggressive crackheads. And I use the term crackheads to encompass all people who are junkies, degenerates, people who want to commit slow suicide on the streets and make it everyone's problem. There's a kind of very like dark narcissism about that, you know, and it's everyone's problem. People have to pay for them, which is why they're all camped at the town hall. And I understand, but as someone who's been working on the streets for 14 years doing this sort of thing, I, I know the psychology of it. And it isn't, uh, the, the base, it isn't what they're trying to portray to the public. It, it's not they're trying to say we are so hard done by that. Look at us. We're pushed right to the edge. We're struggling and we're stressed out because we're right on the edge. When in fact, no, they're putting themselves there in everyone's face to be everyone's problem for drug money. They get benefits. They get help. They get grants given. But it, it doesn't go anywhere. And and so for me, like the, the it needs obviously political start with with Nick Buckley. I think you know for everyone watching this, like I get a lot of most of my viewers are probably in, in the north of England, and then it spreads from, from the world here. So vote for Nick. Vote for something different. Like We need th this political leadership to tell the police to not tolerate. The, well, it starts with begging, aggressive begging, then harassing people at cash machines, and then crackheads fighting each other and terrifying children, which stops families coming into the city to spend money on the weekend. So vote for Nick. Like I, I believe him. I've been watching him on Lotus Eaters. I've interviewed him myself outside the town hall. So I, I'm, speaking, I'm going of, speaking of lotus eaters, that's one of the things that I noticed in Swindon when I was there for the lotus eaters. Uh, that yeah. basically, I, well, white people essentially, but they, they just don't come to the centre of Swindon anymore. They don't go there. Um, they've they've all moved out of Swindon really quite rapidly uh, to, to to various uh, hinter towns, and it, and all the the centre of Swindon now is just it's just closed down shops, um, foreigners, and gangs of people on drugs. Yeah, hanging about. Yeah. It was extremely unpleasant, and I assume. I mean, obviously, I've not been there for a very long time, but I, I mean, that was I was seeing elements of that even when I was in Manchester, um, yeah. and obviously watching Charlie's show as I regularly do. You can you know, you can you can see it there. Um, it's just appalling. 
what as chief of police that you'd effectively be chief of police i mean you'd be director of the, the, the police would answer to you is that right like in london yeah so the mayor of greater manchester is also the police crime commissioner so how would you reform the police so the police will be quite easy to reform i i think um i've spent two decades working with the police i've trained police officers i spent several years based in police stations um, I've got a cabinet full of awards for crime reduction projects that I've created and I've advised three different prime ministers on how to do it across the country. So crime reduction is my number one aim because I'm an expert at it. So how do we change the police? Well, we change the police by ensuring the chief constable sets the standards and does what he needs to do. Now, the chief constable we've got in Greater Manchester is actually doing an okay job at the moment. He's only been in post now two years, three years. But he'll have tight... Um, constraints around him of, of what the mayor Andy Burnham will allow him to do. I'll take those constraints away and say, you, I want you to reduce crime. So how will I help him do that? The first thing is I'll have his back because at the moment, every chief constable in the country and every police officer in the country is scared stiff that if they're doing their job and they get videoed and it gets clipped and put online and they're called a Nazi and a racist, they're scared stiff. The political overlord will throw him under a bus. Now, how do you do your job when you don't trust your ultimate boss not to sacrifice you for some brownie points in the press? I'll yeah. have every police officer's back in Greater Manchester, unless unless they're incompetent or corrupt, in which case I'll hammer them individually. Or if they're prosecuting thought crime, if they're going well, into an autistic girl's house and saying, you said yeah. I was a lesbian, I'm going to arrest you. So that's the second, so second stage is the mayor cannot create new laws or get rid of laws. So hate crime legislation will still stay on the books in Greater Manchester. But what I can do as a police crime commissioner is I set the priorities. So hate crime will be deprioritized. It will still be illegal. It will still be on the books. But it will it'll come last in a list of 10,000 things to do. So basically, the police will never spend any time on hate crime because they'll have no time. So essentially, working. It's, it's, essentially it's, a rev, it's a complete inversion of anarcho tyranny. Anarcho tyranny is you yeah. spend all your money on the hate crime, absolutely no money on the actual crime crime. Uh, yeah. So you're, you're going to reverse that. I, I can well, see yeah. this. And the, yeah. then we, we need to understand why the police are the way they are. So we need to look at recruitment and promotion. So promotion in the police, when you sit in front of that, that promotion panel and you go in from sergeant to inspector, whatever, Part of that interview process is you've got to come up with a fantastic idea that hits DEI, so something woke. So if you could come up with an idea about how you're going to engage blue hair, black lesbians in wheelchairs with Maori face tattoos, you'll probably get promoted. So I'm going to look at promotions. I'm going to get rid of all that, and we'll promote people on competency, merit, understanding of the law, and patriotism. That's what will start promoting people. This will be a five, ten-year project in the promotions because that's what, how long it'll take people to how, move how, will you, how will you promote people based on patriotism how, how is that going to work well at the moment I've, I've, not, I've not worked that one out but i want i want greater manchester police officers to be patriotic and it sounds weird to say it it would have been weird 20 30 40 years ago to say that but saying it now and even if even if i cannot quantify that and i cannot even put that in the promotion board the fact officers on the ground no, that's what the ultimate boss wants. Will will energize them as the ones who love the country and trying to improve the country. It strikes me that for a police officer to go to a gay pride parade and have rainbows painted on them mm. is a political act, and is yep. just as as unacceptable as a police officer going to a I don't know a, a nationalist rally and having Union Jacks painted on their face. They should yeah. do neither. They should be above politics. Absolutely. Our, our police, so sorry, Charlie. Go. On. Sorry, no, just, uh, yeah, that's very interesting what you say about the political marks with the LGBT because uh, that was used as a defense. There was a guy uh, being taken to the courts for, he was through white paint over one of those rainbow crossings, you know, where they make the pedestrians walk over the gay flag. And he said, no, it's not a hate crime because you're making a political statement. I'm doing a political protest by putting white paint on it. And I, I think that's great. So, yeah, but yeah, the police should be apolitical. You shouldn't be flying like a particular, especially now with, so much uh, scandal around transgender, which actually the Vatican, Pope Francis, signed the document Codex Dignitas in, in, in Eternitas today, and he's not he's not for set, like. Well, absolutely outrageous during the Black Lives Matter 
hysteria a few years ago that outside Downing Street, these police officers took knee like that. They should have yeah. been sacked immediately. I mean, there yeah. was there was an outrageous political thing to do before before a baying mob, uh, appalling. I thought. Um. So okay, good. So you that, that's the um that's the police. Now the current mayor of Manchester. I don't know what your views are on this. And Charlie obviously is is Scottish, so that's why I should be careful. But it struck me that during, when they created the the mayoralty of London, I well I almost voted for Ken Livingstone. Oh, I couldn't quite. My, 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 my hand hovered there over voting for him, but I thought he used to be a member of the Labour Party. I can't. I just can't bring myself to vote for him. But but because he was a he was a Londoner and he was born in London. And to be fair, so was the Conservative guy that was his opponent. I forget his name. Um, but uh, the guy that was the Labour candidate, he was from the North of England or something. And it struck me, well, no, no he's not a Londoner. He's not one of us. Um, and and uh, with, with with Andy Burnham, who is the Mayor of Manchester, he's a Scouser. Um, at, who was educated in Cheshire, and then you know he's no, he's not, he's not a Mancunian. I mean, I, I, what do you think of that? Do you think how, how can you be, how can you become a Mancunian? Charlie, do you want to go first? Yeah, thanks. Well, I, I think in a way you can. Like I've got three Mancunian children. Um, I grew up listening to Oasis and a bit, of, you know, a, a bit of the other ones. But um, yeah, like, as someone who's been in this city for twelve years and. Uh, you know, uh, I think I'm going to be here for a lot longer. I think you can become a bit Mancunian. I think to the point, I think the people have accepted me. Um, and uh, I think, you know, as someone who, you know, enjoys the city and ha has a say in it, I, I think you can. But Andy Burnham, I think just on the fact that things haven't improved and the crackhead menace is still so strong, I just can't, I, I just, but we're, we're facing this like, pervasive thought amongst people they're just going to continue voting labor so we need to in this podcast snap through to them because there'll be people that watch this that will be voting labor that watch me because you know working class manchester and we need to reach them and like show them uh, well yeah okay so i've lived in olu for 19 years so i guess i can then say mina olen ololainen i am i am from olu I'm an Olu person. Um, I, I'm all right, fair enough. Um, so, so, um, yeah. So, so this is so. Um, he's your, and it seems to me as well that it should be emphasised. This, this Andy Burnham fellow, um, he was prepared to be shadow Home Secretary under the raving nutter Jeremy Corbyn, uh, who who is currently suspended from the Labour Party for anti-Semitism and God knows what else. Uh, and he was perfectly happy to serve as shadow Home Secretary, as senior shadow minister. Um, as I understand it, under under Corbyn, he was prepared to do that. So, so this is not exactly a principled man. If he wants to then come across and say, oh, "I'm a very reasonable, you know, Labour type person," he was happy to want to help try to put Corbyn in down in Downing Street. Andy Burnham is a good example of what's wrong with our politicians, and it's the fact he's a career politician. He left university and got a job working for an MP, sitting on some policy panel, becoming a junior secretary, working his way up parliament, becoming a minister. That's what's wrong with our politicians, is no one's ever had a proper job. They go from university straight into, I'm now a politician. And if that's your full-time job in your career, then all you worry about is the next step in your career. Just like if you're stacking shelves at Tesco's, you're thinking about, well, my supervisor might be leaving next year. I might go for that job. And that's what he's doing. What we're lacking in our country are states people, states men, states women. Someone who actually says, I'm running for office. I'm going to do these things because these are the right things for this country. And if this costs me my career and I don't get elected again in four years time because I did the right thing, I'll accept that because I know I've left my country in a slightly better position than when I found it. We don't have people like that anymore. We have people now who go, what policy is going to get me elected in three years' time? Because that's my policy. I don't care what it is. I just want to get elected again. And that's why our country is falling apart at the moment. I, I won't forget the poem, uh, resident poet. No, um, the the um, indeed, and what was reassuring, I think, in a, in a weird way, even though I don't, I have a strong visceral dislike of the Labour Party. What I quite liked about the old Labour Party is that quite a lot of them had actually worked. Like they mm. worked properly, you know. They'd been they'd been down mines and things. They'd done they'd done dirty or, or worked in steel factories. They'd done they'd done dirty, hard, mm. tough work. 
I've and been, been soldiers. And if you've I've been, been a soldier, out. you're not sat in parliament as a former soldier going, let's send all our kids to war. Because if you've been in war, you know that's an extremely last resort for you to want to send anyone else's sons to die in a foreign land. That's true. Everybody, every most people of my grandparents' generation had fought in a war. No matter what their social class, no matter what their education, they fought in a war. They, you know, they they had won it. Um, and they, I, I found that quite reassuring as a child. That we, we are run by people who were fought, who fought in a war and won it. I quite liked that. Um, yeah, well, you know, people like Andy Burnham, like he's that these young people that go straight into politics, Tony Blair types, Andy Burnham, many others. They're the they're kind of new princely manager class. They they would never consider going to war or anyone. That's to send the the kind of peasants off to war. Like it's no different than the aristocracy in France that ended up yeah. getting their heads chopped off. You know, like and then the, the new Republicans in France they moved into the same palaces and then you know and now you've got like little Macron who's a Napoleon and it's the same with these politicians. So. We need a breath of fresh air. We both went to very posh universities. Uh, and one of the things that I noticed there was that quite a lot of the very posh people would actually, they had this noblesse oblige. They would finish their degree and then join the army. Yeah. And there were, and there were quite a few of them that did that. They had that sense. They would go to a Sandhurst or whatever. And they, they had that sense of doing that. So And, and of course, they'd been beaten severely through school. So so there, 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 was, there, was, there was some sense in which they had they had lived. Um, but um, this is not the case with the middle class, with the, with the day school, private school type person. You know, and they and I don't know what Andy Burnham is, probably grammar school. But but yes. um, it's um, it's not it's not it's not the case. It's not the case. And that was they, they haven't done anything where you, you know, where you're sort of toughened up, as you say. They just go through. You are you, uh, of course, uh, Nick, have worked with deprived kids. And that was another, th and, and that was another thing that I was going to ask you. So a lot of the problems that it seems to me that Charlie um, uh, uh, records in Manchester are, are based around you know, these thugs uh, who, 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 if only, if only uh, uh, that they, they had um, a, 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 a more conducive environment when they were younger, might be put on a different path. So would you have any policies as mayor as to how to sort of turn them around? Yeah, so the, mayor, the mayor's only got limited power in Greater Manchester, but how I'm going to try to fix that part is I'll be promoting the family. The family will be top of my list of what we need to do in Greater Manchester. We need to bring the family back. And what I mean by that is we need fathers back in the home because most of the people Charlie runs into come from single parent households. They've had no discipline. They've got no aspiration. They've got no personal responsibility. And having a father in the home helps with those traits when you're growing up. Um, and you just look at anybody in society now. It's a lack of personal responsibility all the time. It's not my fault. It's not my fault I'm a crackhead. It's not my fault I'm in jail. It's not my fault I've just thrown acid in some girl's face. It's not my fault. It's not my fault. There's always an excuse you can make about someone else and why they brought that upon themselves or why you're doing this antisocial behavior but the truth is it is your fault you're born and raised in one of the most wonderful countries ever to exist in the world with opportunities everywhere with help and support everywhere and if you can't make it in the uk honestly it's your fault if you can't make it here and we need to start giving people that personal responsibility and stop making excuses for people but some people just can't make it. Some people have very low intelligence and very poor impulse control. And no matter where they are, they're not going to do. They're not going to do much. So what you 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 you'll, you'll need to do something to bring them to their sort of phenotypic maximum, as it were. Yes. To, in, to inculcate them with burger values, as used to happen at schools. Um, and so, what what influence can the mayor of Manchester have on, or Greater Manchester, sorry, have on schooling within Greater Manchester and how things are taught? So the mayor only has responsibility for um, further education, um, which which was devolved last year. So he, ha he has no control over primary, secondary schools. But what the mayor, the, the mayor's superpower in Greater Manchester is access to the press and his mouth and what he says. So I'm going to be I'm going to be creating an education czar in Greater Manchester that isn't going to be inspecting schools like Ofsted because Ofsted's a waste of space anyway. I want an inspector going down schools and working with heads to find out which schools are the woke idiots, which schools look like they've got um, really good exams, but when you speak to the kids and you see what the kids do after they leave, they all go on the dole or they can't get jobs or they've got no aspiration, personal responsibility, or what schools tend to do across the country. 
is or, when you or they do something really stupid, like go and do a humanities <clears throat> degree. So yeah, well, the, the, yeah. That, that, that's a waste of time, but but at least at least you're doing something. But what we need to stop schools doing is at 11, 12 years old, picking the kids they know will fail their exams and cause trouble and then kicking them out for any reason. So we have many people being kicked out of school, sometimes because they're violent, sometimes because we know they're not going to get the grades, which will affect that school's league table. And we need to be looking at that. I want every kid in Greater Manchester to be successful. That doesn't mean university. I didn't go to university. And if that, if success to a certain kid is stacking shelves in Tesco. Well, I would I would argue you really should discourage, universities are going to die. I tell people all the time not to go to university. I've been telling you. To get, yeah. a, get a trade, for God's yeah, sake. That's yeah, where the absolutely. future is going to be with yeah. AI. Yeah. But success is different for everybody. And success for someone who's not that intelligent, not academically gifted, Success for that person is holding down a legal, legitimate job full time, getting married, having children and paying their bills. That's success to me. You don't have to be a brain surgeon. You don't have to have a new BMW. But being a man with personal responsibility and paying your way in the world and raising a family, if you can achieve that, you're top of my list. Excellent. Yes. Um, uh, Charlie, do you have anything to add? No, no. I'm just, just loving everything you're saying there, Nick. Of course. I mean... It starts from the ground up and, you know, Rome wasn't built in a day and we're not going to sort out the crackhead uh, problem overnight, not without uh, devolving into, uh, you know, past regimes that would just like clear everyone out. No, you can't do that. So, of course, you know, the promotion of like, a strong father in the family is, is music to my ears. And I love that. So thank you, Nick. Yeah, I mean, in your in your experiences, Charlie, though, fil filming around Manchester, I mean, what, yeah. what's some of the most extreme things you have seen? For example, you, you have a whole area where... You can just go there and co engage in, you know, cottaging, and, and yeah. nothing is not, and nothing is done. Um, no, and, I mean, and there, if you try to intervene, then you get threatened. I mean, it's the new protected classes, of course, and like you know, the LGBT community are protected, migrants are protected, um, ethnic minorities are, are protected, and this is above, um, you know, above the the native uh, British population. As we joked with uh, our guest last week, uh, Lipton Matthews, who has black privilege. Like I watch some of his shows on YouTube and like I bet they're monetized and YouTube's like, this is great. But if someone else tried having those conversations, not being a, a young, handsome black man, I think you would get into trouble. So, um, yeah. <laughs> so exactly. So he has he has no he, he can he can he can get away with it. So we have a, we have a two tier system. It's like in the old days when but a complete inversion. When if you were a member of the aristocracy, you could you could fight in a duel that you had to have. You, you had to be omnivorous. To, to fight in a duel, and and you could do your degree in three years rather than four, and you could wear certain kinds of fur. There were sumptuary laws, things that only the nobility could do. And now we have an inversion of this, and there's things that only, as you say, the the new protected classes. Well, yeah, I mean, like to to kind of continue your your example of the Cottagers Cove down in the public pass that goes from uh, Piccadilly through to Canal Street. Um, I I literally had a a professional. Um, he worked for a local university. I'm not going to out him, you know. Um, he, he already outed himself very proudly out of the closet, obviously. But uh, he got so offended at me being disgusted by the men engaging in lewd acts that he reported me for a hate crime to the police. And I'm, I still, I, I might do a freedom of information request to see if I have a, a non-crime hate incident recorded against me for expressing my disgust at a man inserting his penis in another man's anus. Yeah, that in is public, hate. in public, like, just in, in public, public. That's, in their bedroom, that's fine, you know, that's where it should be. Um, um, the the, the two-tier policing system across the UK, especially Greater Manchester, ends on day one if I'm elected. And the reason why I know it can end on day one is because as mayor and police crime commissioner, I have the power to sack the chief constable if I deem he's not performing. So he's appointed into the role, he's not recruited into the role. So I can sack him overnight. So I will lay down what I want. And if it's not delivered, he gets sacked. I will find a new chief constable. If they don't do what they should be doing, they get sacked. I will eventually find a chief constable who has the same vision as me, which is one law for everybody. And the reason why we have a two-tier system at the moment, I don't, I know lots of police officers, lots of them contact me at the moment, hoping I become mayor. Um, they're scared stiff. 
They're scared stiff. I'll go back to being thrown under the bus again. They're scared stiff of doing something that their bosses won't like or the mayor won't like, and they're going to have no one protecting them. So it's like, well, I'll let I'll let male prostitutes and I'll let men conduct lewd behaviour in public in Manchester City Centre because if I try to do something, I could lose my job or my career. So leave them. I'm not going to tackle young black men stabbing each other to death because I might not get promoted. I might get called racist. I'd rather then die in their own pools of blood on the streets in Manchester than have that affect my career. So yes. we need somebody who will say to these officers, one law for everybody, and you get you get protected from the very top. Things will start changing extremely quickly in the police. And once that message gets sent out, you'd be surprised how quickly all this woke nonsense can turn in Greater Manchester to a certain extent. And then if we start tackling the antisocial behaviour on the streets, those people in Peckley Gardens only act like that because they know nothing's going to happen. But if we had decent officers in there with a def different chief, a decent chief inspector going, you've just dropped litter, £80 fine. You swear again, I'll arrest you. You do, in fact, you three are arrested now. If you had cracked down in those gardens, not for one day, which what they do now, twice a year they crack down. No one pays attention. If you did it for a couple of months every day, believe me, Pickley Gardens would look something different within a couple of months. So really, that, you need to take the kind of approach of the president of El Salvador, Senor Bukele, and just tell the police to go out there and just arrest anyone that looks like a thug. Um, well, uh, yeah, well, in a way, like the from what my channel shows is that when people get angry at me filming the, these uh, aggressive, um, you know, lifestyle choicers on the streets, the drug takers, like the, the police need to act almost like as a uh, minesweepers. They go out there and speak to them as anyone is allowed to speak to them until they snap and commit a public order crime and then they can be arrested it's not entrapment they're just interacting with them and then they, they do snap they will go crazy and they won't like the attention of the police just chatting to them in the city center so just by like any occupying force you need boots on the ground you need police just walking around the city center chatting to crackheads having and keeping an eye on them confiscating their alcohol catching them as they shoplift running out of aldi with the kind of cheap booze it, it, it all needs to happen if I was going to shoplift, then you might as well shoplift expensive booze. What's the point of shoplifting? Oh, but they, they hire better quality uh, guards at Marks and Spencers and some of the other stores. The oh, bigger ones. Oh, more aggressive yeah. ones, yeah. If, uh, in, in the UK now, if, if you shoplift under £200, you're 99.9% .9 chance of not being arrested and not going to court, even if you get caught. Because if you phone up the police to come and it's under £200, the police are not interested. Yeah, we've legalized shoplifting under two hundred pound. Where in Greater Manchester, what I want is any shoplifter gets caught, the police turn up. And you know, a massive thing people don't talk about is a massive uh, contributor to the inflation and in prices in grocery stores. Yeah, is the crackhead menace. They're trying to say, oh, inflation. It was the the lockdown payout we gave. What was it, furlough? But no, it's the continued increase, massive security. Every store needs to hire all the shoplifting, the loss of stock. That's why we're all paying. And the inflation of food and groceries is through the roof because the crackheads are just helping themselves. Yeah, I say I this all the time to people. I say to people all the time, you think it's it's a victimless crime that they've just stole some stuff out of Tesco's and Tesco's a multi-billion pound company. Well, let them take it, let them take it. Well, no, because we pay for that. That loaf of bread's just gone up a penny. So we pay for everything they've stolen. The shareholders, we pay for it. for it. We pay for it. Indeed, I, I was I was flabbergasted. Uh, you get very substantial price differences within the United States, very substantial. Uh, and I was in California. I was in the Berkeley in the summer, and I couldn't believe how and Detroit as well mm. how expensive it was. And it's expensive to make up for the fact that everyone's fucking stealing. Yeah. Um, with the with the with the with the, with the result that you have that that those losses are passed on to the consumer. It's it's corporatized benefits. So we, as like, you know, law abiding job having people, we're, we're paying a tax on our groceries to fund this instant benefit to crackheads who just literally help themselves. It's like right, universal you know, credit you know, store. You know, a shop called, a sort of shop called Target uh, in, mm -hmm. in America, in, in this place, uh, in this uh, Berkeley. And, uh, and, and a lot of on the, the hangers, you know, a lot of you can't get the stuff off if it's over about $20. You have to get someone to a shop assistant to come and take it off for you so you can't steal it. <clears throat> and if you go to somewhere like Pen like rural Pennsylvania, 
uh, or rural Ohio, you know, some, some small country town, the prices yeah. are so much cheaper. It's mm. unbelievable uh, be be because, of course, they haven't got to take into account the stealing because nobody steals. So, yeah. so it, it's an appalling uh, mess that, to tolerate any kind of stealing. Because once you tolerate it a little bit, then it's a little bit more and they become more brazen. And eventually you get to the point where they, you just have groups of kids just marching mm. in and steal and you make it more acceptable. And, and and the long term consequence for this is we're not doing those people who are shoplifting any favors because we're teaching them to break the law. There's no consequences. How do we expect them to take personal responsibility, get a better life, get a job, raise kids the proper way, and get a family? Well, all we've taught them is you can break the rules and nothing happens. Exactly. We, and they just and they take. Yeah. By the way, Paul, Paul Warburton says the jolly heretic is drinking a drug. It's not a drug. It's a drink. Anyway, um, the 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 um, it gets me up in the morning. Um, so 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 no, that's that's uh, that's you know, nothing happens. Uh, and and that's the thing with minor drugs as well. Um, that's why I referenced that. Minor drugs tend to be the gateway to major drugs, and minor criminality is the gateway to major yeah. criminality. So it needs to be it needs to be. Yeah, you know, when I'm talking about minor criminality, I'm talking about minor criminals like Andy Burnham, who had a two thousand pound fine for speeding. Yeah. Minor criminals. And um and, and that and that that is the gateway to major crime, like you know doing nothing to help Manchester over a seven year period, um and 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 letting crime and and begging and homelessness get completely out of control. You know major crime. It's it's the it's it's the it's the gateway. So um yeah um uh, um uh yes uh Wig Alert says I would like to know more about cottaging and George Michael. Yeah, well George Michael obviously the singer of wham who then went solo you know he's got to have faith um he got caught in i think beverly hills um propositioning a policeman undercover policeman with his uh, john thomas and the policeman arrested him for offering his john thomas in the male lavatories at, in, a, in a public park in beverly hills hmm. yeah and that's what's happening in um, what, what, what you call cottage in cottages cove that, 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 that people are offering their um the cell. Yeah, that, this is the thing. Like, as as mayor, I think Nick would be in support of uh, privatizing Cottagers Cove into a private members club where the men could, uh, you know, have a, a nice, safe, organized environment away from prying eyes to in, to, to enjoy themselves. You know. So as I, I I've discussed this with Charlie before, I've actually worked on this problem in that area twenty years ago. So Cottagers Cove is technically is technically called the Piccadilly Undercroft. So it's an underground tunnel that has a footpath and a canal. It's the Rochdale Canal. So we have holidaymakers using the canal going down with kids on board. And when I was based in the city centre police station as a council manager, we were getting reports, complaints from holidaymakers on barges saying, my six-year-old girl has just watched 15 men have sex on the towpath on the canal. So we had to try to do something about it. Um, and we we tried to we tried to we spent a year consultating with the LGBT community because we couldn't do it straight away in case we got called homophobic. So we spent a year talking to gay people, and ninety nine percent of them said it's disgusting what goes on down there. You need to shut it down. And then the week we were going to enforce it with police officers, it all got cancelled from high up above, saying we just don't want the negative press attention. So we allowed illegal behaviour to continue on a public footpath that children can see when they're going past in barges. Absolutely disgraceful. And this was 15, 20 years ago. So it's worse now. It's yeah. It's important to just state that, you know, there's nothing, you know, anti-gay or homophobic about this. If there was like a, a public pass where straight couples were like filming, like shooting porno, mm -hmm. and like there was barges with children going past, they would get dealt with by the police. I think yeah. it's because it's very sensitive, you know, Oh, you know, LGBT, you know, we got Pride Month. Don't upset, you know, I think it's a very sensitive thing. And, you know, I, I get accused of being homophobic, which couldn't be further from the truth. I've got many gay friends and I want them to enjoy their, 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 you know, their homes like every, everyone else. And it's such a tiny fraction of the gay community, like less than 0.1% of that and want to engage in, you know, illegal acts. I mean, so it's just important to state straight people having sex in public is not allowed either. Yeah, I mean, what we need to tell people is you obey the law. If you don't yeah. like the law, you 
challenge it and you change the law by using your MPs and the House of Commons. You change laws. You don't ignore laws, break laws, or complain about laws. Change them. Because while it's on the books, it will be enforced. Um, and I'm tired of us picking which laws we're going to enforce and which laws we're not going to enforce. Yeah. It can destabilize also, the whole system. You also have an idea that you, you want to reduce the size of Greater Manchester. You want to allow people in the in places like Bolton or whatever to, to, to stop being part of Greater Manchester. A little bit. Yeah, it's a little bit complicated, this. So in 1974, Greater Manchester was invented. Before 1974, Greater Manchester did not exist. It was Lancashire, Cheshire, and a little bit of Yorkshire. And the Tory government at the time said, no, we're going to split it up because we want to start creating administration areas across the UK. So they created Merseyside, they created Humberside, they started creating all these new areas. And we lost connections with those ancient counties. Now, Bolton is part of Greater Manchester and has been for 50 years. We were never asked, did we want to leave our old county and become part of Greater Manchester? And many people across Greater Manchester, but especially in Bolton, hate Greater Manchester and want to go back to the old county. So there's a group called Bolton for Change, which has set up a petition for this. My stance, if I become mayor, is I don't know if Bolton will be better off or worse off leaving Greater Manchester. I don't know, but it's not my judgment. What I will do if I'm mayor is I will support them to have a referendum to find out what the people of Bolton want. And whatever the people of Bolton want, I will support that. And that goes to anybody else in Greater Manchester. Excuse my ignorance. Are both Rotherham and Rochdale in Greater Manchester? Only Rochdale. Rochdale. Right. So that was another thing I was going to ask you about. So that was where she was from. That girl you met the other day, Charlie, Katie yeah. Fanning, yeah. Who, I, who I told you was a victim of, she must have been from Rochdale. Yeah. So Ro Ro Rochdale grooming gangs. Yeah. And and the social workers and the 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 yeah. the, the, the impotence in the face of political correctness, which 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 resulted <clears throat> in that being allowed to go on for years and years and years. Yeah. Um, what would you do? What, what would you? Is, is that something you could interfere with? The how social workers well, often. Think like very quickly like the answer to that like there is one massive elephant in the room that no one wants to discuss about the grooming gang scandal is um as you know, it's kind of broken homes, like broken English, white English working class homes where the teenage girls are left to go fend for themselves until one o'clock in the morning, hanging outside kebab shops and corner shops. So where are these parents? Where's the fathers? Why is no one looking after these young girls? And mm. like, like, of course, this isn't to take away any of the responsibility of the rapist monsters who preyed on them. But, uh, you know, no one wants to talk about the kind of lack of parenting. To, to allow that to happen. I would never let my, my young daughter go hang outside a chip shop at midnight on, on a school night. Like, what the hell? Or indeed any night. Any night. Yeah. And, and that's why I want to promote family because you're spot on there, Charlie. These girls have been let down by everybody, but the first people to let these girls down were the parents. Then it was the police, then it was social workers, then it was the pedos. They've been let down she, by she everybody. Me, she said to me when I interviewed her, I said, well, why didn't your parents stop you from doing this? And, then, and she said that her stepfather, right, having a stepfather for a start yeah. is yeah. A, a bad thing and predicts all kinds of uh, problems, um, was friends with the um, Indian restaurant owner that was abusing her. Yeah. Oh, but I, I, listened to that, I listened to that podcast um, and... Um, it, she was extremely vague, like uh, about what happened. Like for someone who's claiming this victimhood status, um, it seemed like her stepfather friend had an Indian restaurant. He was an Indian guy, and one of the staff members of the owners. It sounds almost like she got into a relationship with him, but I, I think she discredited herself when I was filming in Manchester very badly. And uh, I don't think we should really talk about her anymore because she's not worth it. Well, all right, no, but you can see why she's reacted like that. Exactly what she said. That extreme reaction, that that way of dealing with the world. You can see why someone yeah. that's fourteen yeah. and all that stuff's happened to her would turn into such a such a person. I just thought it was very interesting. Um, okay, we're about halfway through. So to those of you, oh, we have a poem. We have a resident poet here at the Jolly Heretic, uh, Nick, uh, Mister Mister Quinn, and he has written a po a poem in honour of your appearance today, uh, as follows: Our guest gave us all for a charity. But the left, with shocking barbarity, in a terrible trick, they ousted poor Nick 
but with him we will show solidarity. So thank you very much, Mr. Quinn. Thank you. And um, if you would like to uh, buy Mr. Quinn's book of a jolly heretic poetry, uh, it is of course available on. Uh, the old Amazon. And we're about halfway through. So if you're new to the Jolly Heretic, hello, hello, hello. Welcome, Jolly Heretic. We are an online public house. It's on Monday at 7 pm UK time, which we discuss the kind of based research that is increasingly expanded from our woke joke universities. If you are new, A, please, please, please subscribe. Subscribe here uh, and subscribe on the, the jollyheretic.com, which is my uh, sub stack where I can put all of the based content that I don't put on YouTube and where if you'd like what I do, you can become a supporter for as little as the cost of a pint of beer a month. Um, link is in the description. You can also uh, buy Jolly Heretic merchandise on Etsy. You can sign up for my course at, again, uni. You can send in questions on entropy at any time. Uh, you, can send, uh, you can send in Bitcoin. Uh, you can um, uh, you can become a funder on Subscribestar, in which case we can chat over Skype and uh, be like twins. And of course, you can buy my books. Uh, the most... Uh, the most recent of which, which I like to feel is a uh, a reasonable uh, introduction uh, to my uh, to, to, to my thinking for the for the uh, for the uninitiated, uninitiated and is written in a fun way. Um, is uh, the naked classroom the evolutionary psychology of your time at school? And while you're at it, please subscribe to Charlie's channel. That's Charlie Beach. Uh, you just go into YouTube and you will find it. Uh, he, if you're not familiar with his stuff, then he goes he goes around Manchester filming. It's the generation on the ground. Um, and subscribe to Nick's channel, uh, which is just uh, Nick Buckley again. His name you can put it into YouTube. And most importantly today, most importantly, if you are watching and you live in Manchester or its environs, then we humbly ask that you put your cross next to Nick's name um, in the election on the 2nd of May. All right, I'm going to move on to some um, some questions that have been sent in, which I also ask, I, I also invite my guests to contribute to if they have some some views on. And then once we've done that, we'll, we'll move back to uh, discussing Nick's, uh, Nick's campaign. Um, so, oh, so yes, good. So the first question is from... Uh, Yes, from Tony Wenham, and he says, I think this is for you, Charlie. He says, any commies out in Manchester, Trump 2024? Well, yeah, I mean, there's always commies out in Manchester. There's a, I'm always looking over my shoulder in Manchester. And like the, to start with, the crackhead menace, it kind of comes in, in kind of peaks and troughs. And we're going through a trough at the moment. But a week ago, it was extremely high. But commies, every weekend, they form a major part of the pro-Palestinian march. It's full of Marxists and socialists, and uh, yeah, it's it's it just it just never stops. And uh, you know, as we discussed, Nick, uh, sorry, not Nick, um, Ed, uh, hello, Nick. But we um we've discussed in the past, they they are slightly mentally ill. They're very unhappy people, and uh, of course, they would join a cause that is holding so many hostages, and you know, like spread trying to spread Islamism. So you know, it's just the commie menace is in a way the crackhead menace. It is the kind of fascist menace. It's there's a lot of menaces going on at once. I wonder if they the commies they quite they they a lot of them they they don't sort of actually commit crime because they're too socially conformist and hyper socially conformist and whatever. But they get a vicarious thrill out of watching other people do so. And, and they and they get a vicarious thrill uh, out of out of out of see out of because they hate everything to do with power and Look, anything. To do with all power. all straight, hardworking English people, or and like this includes the Jews as well, because the lefties see the Jews as just like special forces of white people, because that you know they're a successful minority, and so anything that we do that is like building a society, they see it as the Death Star, and they see crackheads and criminals as the kind of the kind of uh, X fighter, like you know, Rebel Alliance destroying the Death Star. They see anything that is beautiful and good and wholesome as an oppressive, evil empire of darkness. They do. Mm, they do because they are. They ultimately have this paranoia about not having power, and they have this desire for power, and they have this bitterness, and therefore anything that represents power, they want to tear down. And anything that represents chaos, challenges the power, and therefore is good. Um, yep. And uh, what, what do you think, Nick? Yeah, I think that plays into a theory I've got, again, about personal responsibility. Because these individuals won't accept personal responsibility, everything wrong in their life has to be someone else's fault. And an easy answer is capitalism. If only we had communism, my life would be a lot better. But the fact is, if you lived under communism, your life would be a lot worse. But your life could be better in the UK if you took some responsibility and started changing your life for the better. 
Here, here. Okay. Uh, Joe says, where can I find a Jolly Heretic reading list? Um, on edwarddutton.com, Joe, I've put a Jolly, a, a jolly Heretic reading list. Uh, Joe also says, thank you, sir. Uh, if, you, if you are joined by Charlie Veach, please would you ask him if he has heard of Peter Santanello? Does he like his content and would he consider making similar content? Yes, I, I know I know of Peter Santanello. I've watched many of his YouTube broadcasts. He is a, a very, you know, entertaining American presenter that goes around into the Amish community, into the Jewish community, into the crackhead community of inner cities and does a kind of documentary. So uh, would I do content like his? His is far more polished and professional and safe for, uh, you know, safe for, for work. And I'm a bit more at the kind of rougher edges, a bit more... Uh, wild and like untamed whereas uh he's a very well kept very well kept uh gentleman but yeah i like peter santanello i watch his stuff i think we like the uh, we, we, we like the wildness of the way that charlie does it i think i think i think that's yeah and that's what attracted me to you ed like you are kind of like a, an internet anthropologist speaking to the wildest animals the most you know the kind of strangest creatures out there and i thought that's that's fantastic and um you know um Someone has to, so yeah. Well, indeed, someone has to. Someone has to find that niche. Uh, Joe also says, uh, why is there a significantly higher percentage of women in the IDF compared with other military forces in the world? Uh, I have, I mean, that's just an historical quirk, isn't it? That when when the Israelis were based, as I understand it, were basically fighting against the British um, uh, with, uh, in the in the uh, after the war, uh, women got involved. And I don't know, and they got involved in, in a fairly major way. And about 20% of those that were fighting were women. And it seems to have hung over into the state of Israel, whereby it's one of the only states that mandates military service for women. Um, uh, and uh, so um, I, I guess it's some quirk of the fact that there were so many women that were involved in the in the, in the in the fight against the British, uh, and, and I, I don't know. I I I can only guess. I would I... I would also guess it's because the Jews, at many points last century, were fighting for their existence. So what is the point of having women at home who may not be as good as the men fighting? I'm not saying they are. I'm just saying they may not be as good. But do you know what? We need everybody here because if we lose, we're wiped out. They're going to kill all of us. And I don't yeah, think, you know, from my point of view, I, I, th I don't think the Israelis stand out as, you know, this like 20th century thing of so, like so many women in the forces. Like, look at the Kurdish. They're very much pro-woman in their fighters. Uh, the, you know, I'm sure the Vietnamese and the Khmer Rouge, yeah. they were very full of women as well. So you, you, you use what you can. That's a great you know? point, Charlie. I think, I think it's, I think that what Nick's saying is right. I think there's, there's a fervor to it. So the if you if you if you feel that you're going to be wiped out, absolutely yeah. wiped out, then you okay, you'll get women involved as well. Or if you're absolutely fanatical, so one of the things that you had in the Finnish Civil War was that you had um, uh, in 1918 was you had women battalions, but on the red side, not on the white side, on the red side, because they they were they were they they were the absolute sort of fanatics. So yeah, well, fanatics. also like there's a there's a nice you know poetry to. You know, Islamists who are probably very like anti women having any rights whatsoever being, um, you know, defeated by, you know, women in the IDF. I think it kind of goes. Yes, full I'm, told, I'm told I'm told that the, the, the Yazidis set up a resistance force against ISIS with a lot yeah. of women in it. And for the for the Muslims, it was like the ultimate humiliation, you know, to, 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 be, to be killed by a woman or to be a. Uh, uh, put in, into custody by a woman, so I don't know. Perhaps that's relevant as well. I mean, they were quite. They had a female prime minister in Israel quite early on, didn't they? But, um, so, <coughs> so yeah, Meyer, yeah. Golda Meir, yeah. So that's that's very interesting. Um, okay, uh, Low Mercury Tuna says, "Did you say if one person talks with a massively different IQ, if if one if a person one talks with has a massively different IQ, effectively can be very difficult or impossible. I seem to remember you saying something like that. Please explain more. Um, yeah, there was a there was a theory, um, whoever asked that, uh, Low Mercury Tuna, there was a theory that basically you can only talk to somebody who is two standard deviations, i.e. 30 points, uh, more or less intelligent than you. And then after that, communication becomes quite difficult. And so there is then this theory that as intelligence goes down, 
um, in, for example, we've lost about 20, 15 IQ points since 1880, then people that are very clever, like Enoch Powell or something, are going to be unable to go into politics because they simply won't be able to communicate with the average person anymore. There, there is there is that theory. Um, but but then, as I understand it, that, that theory has been rather disputed because um, intelligent people um, have one of the markers of intelligence is good theory of mind. So intelligent people have the ability to work out just how how you speak to like a dog or a cat differently or a child. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That you would, that you, yeah. would that you would you would you would you would understand that better as an intelligent person, and you would therefore be better at communicating with people that were uh, significantly less intelligent than you. Um, but, but but obviously there's a communication gap. The things you can talk about because vocabulary is associated with intelligence, kind of interests mm-hmm. associated with intelligence, and so it's difficult to have a. But I mean, um, an example. Imagine if you have an. I want to say this. Imagine if you have an IQ of 145. So that's three standard deviations above the mean. So a very clever, very, very, very clever person going to a normal school where the average IQ is 100. Right. That is the equivalent of sending an average IQ person to a school full of people with an IQ of 50, i.e. Wow. people with Down syndrome. Mm. And you can yeah. see how frustrating that would be for the average person. So think yeah. how frustrating that would be for the 145 super clever uh, person, you know, rather, mm. rather cruel. It's like a personal hell, like probably the worst kind of hell. Like, so you're saying that for a very clever 145 IQ to go to a normal school is like a normal person going to a school full of Down syndrome. Yes, that's what it would be like. That imagine, like, so all our viewers and myself going to a school where everyone's got Down syndrome and you have to do that for 13 years, you would hate the system so much. You'd be against academia, you'd be against ever bettering yourself. You'd, you'd have be, problems you'd, with close friendships. You'd have, pro- you'd have problems with doing what they do. You'd probably have problems having conversations on their level to some yeah. extent. You'd be and they'd ostracize you. They'd, they'd, they'd <clears throat> think that you're some sort of like evil genius demon. That you're not even human, you know, if, if you were like that clever around them. Wouldn't they? They'd, they'd see you as like a, a vampire. Yeah, but well, at least if they have Down syndrome, people that have Down syndrome are very, very pro-social and kind. Mm-hmm. So take away that. There's no reason that they should have that. Take that away. Just make them have an IQ of fifty, then, 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 yeah, that's 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 exactly how they see you. It would be, it would be, it would be extremely unpleasant. So, this is a little bit like the film Goodwill Hunting. Yeah, if you remember that film, so th- yeah. that was if you if you don't say it's basically some some young adults who are into crime, into violence, but one of them is a genius. Um, and he manages to keep all his friends, but but he's an absolute genius. And it's, a university professor finds him and starts developing. But but yeah, it, 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 that's sort of the story. A good example is Nick Nick, uh, Nick uh, Ted Kaczynski, the Unabomber. Yeah, he had an IQ of about one hundred and fifty or something, and it just yeah. sent him mad. It just sent him mad. He couldn't deal with society. He retreated mm-hmm. to living in the woods of Montana and then started mm-hmm. murdering people. It just sent him crazy that he was he was he was so much more intelligent than everybody else. Right, Mark Zia says, "Are you supporting the zero seats campaign? The zero seats campaign is the, is the campaign that the Conservatives should get no seats." Um, well, I will answer first. I was the secretary of Wimbledon Young Conservatives. I was the cha- when I was seventeen. I was the chairman of a ward committee that had members on it that were born in like nineteen oh nine. I've supported the Conservative Party, but I'm appalled by them. They've done nothing in fourteen years in power. Nothing. They could have reversed all of the terrible anti-free speech laws that Blair passed, that you, know, you no longer have double jeopardy, that you no longer have the right to remain silent, uh, that you know that all these restrictions on free speech and all this that he brought in, all of these terrible things that were brought, restrictive things, motivated by race crimes, whatever. All this stuff, all the way that they politicised the police, they politicised the civil service, they politicised the schools everything. They created basically a a proto-woke state. And once Boris got a majority of 80, they could have tried to reverse some of that. Mm. They've done absolutely nothing. So, so I I mean, nothing. Worse than nothing. Immigration, which is the one thing that working class people don't want, is immigrants that have to to compete for their jobs. Um, Is a million a year or whatever, it's some ludicrous amount, 25,000 people a week 
Um, it's the one thing they voted against in the referendum in uh, 2016. And so, yeah, I think it would be probably a good thing if, the, if there was a, a sea change in politics and the Conservative Party was just wiped out. They don't deserve, they do, they've done nothing. They don't yeah. deserve to, it just, they, they need to go. That's my view. Well, I yeah, completely, I mean, I, sorry, you go ahead, Nick. I completely agree. I can also say this is the worst government in my lifetime. We've had other governments that have made mistakes, you know, the Labour Party, Blair's Party, bankrupt the country. We've had other issues. But this government for 14 years have failed on almost every front. Everywhere you look, there's an issue. It's not just no money. There is no money in the country anymore now. It's everything. I hope they get hammered at the election. Whether or not they get wiped out completely and never recover, personally, I don't care. As long as they get a political beating, a huge beating at the general election, that's what they need. Charlie? Yeah, I mean, during the COVID crisis, uh, as it turned out quite quickly within a few months that it wasn't as severe as we worried, countries like Sweden uh, maintained no lockdown. <laughs> Businesses went on as usual and they trusted their people to be adults and to, you know, just take precautions and carry on as usual. The way the Tory government sucked Satan's cock so hard, so hard, like one of the top nations with the fear mongering, they, they actually used military intelligence people to like try and, you know, get the message across the propaganda. They used fear tactics during lockdown. Um, the Daily Telegraph actually got some people in government that were using these fear tactics to apologize. And just for fellating the Dark Lord so hard, I do support this zero seats thing. Fuck them, man. To hell with the Tories. What have they conserved? They're called the Conservatives. Nothing's been conserved. Nothing's it's a rape conserved. fest out there. It's a crackhead rape fest. Cities need to be walled and turned into big game reserves. Like it's gone. Oh, indeed. And what have they what have they preserved? All of the most woke things, all of this transsexuality, all of it has happened under conservative government. Under a yeah. conservative government, I mean, you look back. Okay, you could argue that the Blair government set the set the stage for it, but they didn't have to pass these laws. They didn't have to do these these uh, uh, these uh, totally um, un unconservative laws. So no, I, I I I for the first time in my life, I'm going to not vote conservative. And I don't know, and I don't, I don't know what to vote in in this, in because I can vote as an expat. Um, because the Reform Party have annoyed me by sacking various yeah. perfectly reasonable candidates. Um, but I, I, guess, I guess if it's such as Bo from the, the Lotus Eaters, but I, I guess if the goal is zero seats and that is the goal, then that's who mm. I'm going to have to vote for just because I'm not going to vote Labour. That would be, I can't do that. But so, so I guess I would vote for the Reform Party and I advise others to do so. I know they're cucks, but, but, but just do it because the goal is zero seats. I shall thus instruct my father who's my proxy voter to, to to do that okay the the next question comes from i'll do your question on genius harita uh, when i come back so i'll have to research that also it's not really relevant to these two chaps uh tony wenham says um if there is a protest this saturday i shall be out with my trump flag and stand with the jewish community if they are out i might see you around smiley face with some sort of cigarette you know i'm glad he's he's raised this like People are coming to the realization, like after October 7th, that Israelis and, you know, Jew Jewish people across the world are very much an integral part of civilized society that wants to raise children, educate them, work hard and, and like live in peace. And like the fact that we've got every Saturday thousands, hundreds of thousands across Europe and across the world, like supporting Hamas and cheerleading is actually a disgrace. And it ties into this Tory mismanagement. In Germany, they've banned the pro-Palestine marches because of the kind of tacit support for Hamas. But here in Britain, they're desecrating war monuments. They're, 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 they're setting off fireworks, scaring people. You know, it's, it's just not right. Go on, I, I was going to say, the way I judge those marches is if you can turn up with a Union Jack and wave that Union Jack, the flag of the country you stood in, you can tell a lot by the people who are marching past you. If they attack you, abuse you, then you know they're not on your side. They're not on the side of the country you're stood in at that moment in time. And that's my big beef with the free Palestine marches. I don't mind people marching. I don't mind people protesting things I think are wrong. That's all okay. But there's a real 
feeling of anti-Britishness here? Are we going to pull everything down, burn it to the ground, and we're going to build society up again because we know uh, better? I was in Whitechapel uh, a few weeks ago filming for a documentary, uh, and I noticed that there was a... Um, there was a sort of a monument that had been erected um, in this now completely Muslim area to Edward the Seventh, and it had been uh, when he died in uh, 1910, and it had been funded by the, the local Jews. They had, they had put this up, uh, and they had put it up um, a, a year after he had died. So they put it up in 1911, and I thought to myself, well, we're two years now, aren't we, after the Queen died? So wh where is the monument by the local Bengali people of Whitechapel to the Queen that they yeah. funded? Where, where, I, where I don't I, and I, I looked around and I couldn't find one. Um, uh, the next question comes from Jared Lopez, and he says, uh, "Why did Protestantism develop? Development seem to happen only among Germanic people: Prussia, Switzerland, Germany, Scandinavia, American Britain. Uh, how do people do reasons this play into the development of hate crime laws in some of these places, if it does at all?" Um, interesting sorry, question. Ed, sorry, sorry to jump in. Could you read that a little bit more slowly? The question there, please. Sorry. 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 I beg your pardon. Why did Protestantism develop? Development seem to happen only among Germanic people: Prussians, Swiss, Germans, Scandinavians, Americans, Brits. Uh, how do the reasons for this play into the development of hate crime laws in some of these places, if it does at all? Thank you, Jared. So I'll, I'll start. Um, it seems to me that this goes back to William James's distinction between the religion of the sick soul and the religion of healthy mindedness. Uh, the religion of the sick soul is associated with um, high anxiety. You would expect high social anxiety the further north you go because it's colder. And so there would be more selection for high social anxiety and thus a form of uh, basically of mental illness, but of pro-social uh, mental illness um, because of the social pressures of it being colder and more difficult to survive. Um, and therefore you would expect, um, that's, that's the first thing. Um, the second thing is that as, as you go north, there seems to be much more in the way of individualism um, in, a, in a weird kind of way, a, a sort of a genius culture, a kind of acceptance of uh, uh, that you are not clannish, that you are individual and you achieve things, and that and that is how you gain social status, which militates in favour of a religion which says that you as an individual are answerable to God uh, personally, rather than you as an organisation. So I think you have these two things, but I think mainly the anxiety, and that attracts that that kind of slightly mentally unstable person that is really the kind of left wing person of their time in some ways who then plays for status via saying, I am more virtuous than the last person, I am more godly than the last person, um, and it is from this that Protestantism and Proto-Protestantism come. I am more virtuous than the last person, I am more godly than the last person, in a broadly conservative context. And so, yes, then if you have higher social anxiety, you're going to get more people that behave like that, that social signal in that way, um, and, and then you can see how if you were to take it into a left-wing society, that very mentality, the social anxiety, which causes you to be more woke than the last person, uh, would, op would operate in the same manner. So I can see how the two things would be connected, yes. Very, very interesting. So the further north you are, the more neurotic, but that could be pro-social because you're worried about the kind of medium to long term and you're telling all the people in your tribe that we need to go and Put the berries away or, or stuff like that yeah. but then it's like then it can like go out of get, get crazy in your mind and then you become someone who's imposing hate and crime both, right and in both instances it's the women that lead it as george orwell said it's always the women it was the women that were massively behind protestantism even like yeah. the, the Munster rebellion all of it it was women uh, because they are higher in social anxiety and they're more uber socially conformist um, um, and, and so if the social conformism is to be highly religious, then you become extremely religious. If social conformism is to be woke. There's certain nuances. I mean, I, like the Irish are quite low in neuroticism, uh, which is probably why they stay, they're an outlier in terms of staying Catholic, potentially. Okay. But also, but also there, was, there was a degree to which any nation 
the, the, the religion becomes wrapped up with the nationhood, and so they're Catholic to rebel against the English, the Welsh yeah. uh, uh, Methodist to rebel against the English or whatever. But it's a very interesting question. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. That's my, my answer. Karhab Mass says, not to suggest you are containment, but people, sorry. Um, uh, Karhab Mass says, I have heard that Hope Not Hate Report is basically a shopping catalogue for the establishment to see if they want to buy anyone. Containment for hire sort of thing. Not just you are containment, but people they view as a potential prospect they might want to buy off. Well, I can tell you that nobody has tried to buy me off. Um, and uh, I, I was very glad to be uh, in the Hope Not Hate report alongside yeah. wicked extremists like Rishi Sunak. Um, but but uh, it, it seems that the, that the Hope Not Hate report suffers from a kind of overreach now. Um, you know, Posey yeah. Parker, feminists. It's very similar, you know, like I, I read the Hope Not Hates for yourself and uh, Posey Parker. I found them very humorous. Uh, there was an organization, the Anti-Defamation League. They, 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 they mistakenly thought Pepe the Frog, a little internet mascot that can be used for anything, was a far right hate symbol for Nazis. And, uh, that you know, these organizations, they, they're always looking for things. But I love how the conspiracy has swallowed you in, Ed, that if the establishment says that you are a bad man, it's obviously because they're trying to advertise you as a as a kind of a bot bad man. Like also the the fact that I haven't come out in favor of Hamas uh, oh. to such, just to some people means that I'm obviously being paid by the secret services. Oh, the fact that you're not supporting rapists and murderers, who, you know that. So you you must be obviously on the payroll of MI5 and MI6, of course. Yeah, that's that's that's, that's some people's uh, views. Um, final question we have um is from uh oh no, have I done them all? I think I have. Oh well, I'll do this one now then. Our genius. Oh, just another. Um, hang on, sorry. Uh, I would like to know. We've done, we've done George Michael comedies in Manchester. I think that's it. If there's supposed Saturday. Uh, yeah, okay. Arjuna is more dismissive of women, um, asks Harita. Uh, more dismissive of, of... Oh, do you know what I've forgotten to do, chaps? I, I've forgotten to sign well, into the old entropy. It's like we're, we're coming to the end, and I've forgotten to sign into entropy. That's insane. Um, I don't know how I... Hang on. Are we on? No, we're on. Yeah, we're on, we're on. We're on. We're on. I got a bit confused there. I normally I sign into entropy, and I've forgotten to do so. Um, oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so anyway, it doesn't matter. So, um, yeah, the, your, your question about genius is being dismissive of women, Harita, dismissive of women. I'm going to have to research that. I know that, that they tend to be men, um, but but um, they, they the dismissive of women, I don't know. Anyway, um, I'll have to I'll have to look into that. So we're gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna round up now. So I would like to thank uh, both. Uh, unless there's anything else we haven't covered with regard to Nick's campaign, anything else you'd like to say, Nick? Anything else? Um, no, if you live in Greater Manchester, then check me out, have a look, find me on social media, have a look at my manifestos on my website, nickbuckley4mayor.co.uk, check me out, and if you like what I say, then please vote for me. Okay, vote, vote, vote for Nick, vote for someone that is not a career politician, and who wants to sort out all of these terrible problems there are on, on the streets of Manchester, which Charlie documents, and which I've experienced. I had a friend that was mugged at knife point walking up Oxford Road and mar march to a cash machine and to get money out. You know, the guy said, yeah. I don't want to cut you, but I need money for drugs. So if you if you try to think, I will cut you. You know, imagine how frightening that is. And that was like 25 years ago. So imagine how much worse it is now. So yeah. so so we need those chaps. And then Manchester perhaps can be can be the New York, you know, can be can be turned around from being a crime ridden kind yeah. of place, which New York was in the 80s. It was completely out of control. Um, to to a relatively safe kind of place. Not to be weird. Okay, thank you, everybody. I won't be here next week because I'm in the ne the Netherlands. Um, but we will be here the week after that, and I will see you all then. And goodbye. If you like that video, don't forget to subscribe to the channel, hit that notification bell, and comment. And if you like what I'm saying about running for Mayor of Greater Manchester, then stick around. Tell your family. Tell your friends. It's the only way I'm going to have a chance of winning is a grassroots movement. So be part of that movement and hit that bell. Thanks.